Well, okay, what's the smooth muscle? I think it's under capillaries. Yeah, so smooth muscle is incorporated into our, it's not capillaries, blood vessels. Blood vessels. It'll be within um, the, the middle, the tunic media. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if, if you look in there, you'll see something um, called the, the, the middle layer, the tunic media. That's smooth muscle. That's smooth muscle. Or, or at least it contains smooth muscle. Um, what was the other one that we... Fibrous tissue. Yeah, fibrous tissue again. So the, the tunic interna, tunic media, and tunic externa. The tunic externa is made of fibrous tissue. It's a connective tissue that holds everything together. And then there was one more, right? Pathway of, the heart. of the heart. So the internal pathway of the heart is what goes between the two nodes, the SA node and the AD node. So if you look at that conduction system in the heart, the sinoatrial node, it's up in the, uh, for most of us, the kind of upper breastbone side of the right atrium. And then there's the atrial ventricular node that's sort of across the atria from that, right where the atria and the ventricles are. There are specialized cardiomyocytes in there that don't really stick out any different than the other cardiomyocytes, but they conduct the pathway, the, the, the electrical activity between the SA node and the AD node, and, and even over into the other atrium. So it's the spot between the two nodes? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. So it's, it, that's, that's not really showing it, but it is showing it. It's, it's just showing that. You know, this is how the signal comes through. It comes mm -hmm. through sort of on these pathways. But there's actually a, a pathway there. Okay. You'll just be that part. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So today, um, we're going to pick up with the hypothalamus. Okay. And the hypothalamus, again, we're finding this. Uh, below the thalamus, which is below the third ventricle in the brain, and it's made up of all of these different uh, nuclei. And these are groups of nuclei um, or groups of nervous cells that have a very common function in a variety of different uh, physiological processes. Uh, and, and they give you, in this image here that I'm showing on the screen, give you a few different examples, but there's a lot more. There's a lot of things that are regulated by the hypothalamus, and probably even things that are being regulated by the hypothalamus that we don't even really understand. Okay, so but for the purposes here of sort of the anatomical perspective of the hypothalamus, we're going to take a look just as uh, at these ten nuclei or the ten most. Uh, in, important nuclei. So I think this is right where I left off on Wednesday. Uh, so we're going to pick up here. So again, you look at the hypothalamus, if we were to dissect a mouse or even a human brain, and we're like, okay, so here's the hypothalamus. We're not going to see these 10 distinct individual tissues. They all look the same. But when we go in and chemically assess uh, or analyze those regions, we have different molecules that are being produced, different composition. Uh, compositions of those molecules and different functions arising from these individual areas within that tissue. Okay, and each of these areas defined really by their function, what they're doing are called nuclei. And there are 10 of them that I'm going <laughs> to introduce you to today. So 10 different nuclei. Uh, again, where are these located? What's the anatomical address, so to speak? for each of these nuclei. The hypothalamus itself is going to be saddled in the floor of the third ventricle of the brain. Okay, so saddled in the third ventricle in the brain. So this is basically right near the base of the brain. And each of these nuclei is not defined off of anatomy, but is defined off of their function. 
or off of their physiological purposes. What are the regulatory roles? Are they regulating water balance? Are they regulating blood pressure? Are they regulating sodium content of the blood, chemical composition of the blood? What is their main regulatory effect, if you will? Okay, so um, one of them, I'm just going to sort of label these off. Um, really what, what I'm trying to do here is just kind of give you an introduction to all of the different kinds of uh, nuclei that, that exist. I, I'm not as concerned uh, for the anatomy here, but really what is happening in each of these <laughs> nuclei. Um, so the posterior nucleus, also sometimes referred to as the posterior hypothalamic area as it is here. One of the things that's been indicated is a shivering response. So this is a body temperature regulating region. So we should expect that arising from this region, if we begin to get cold, the things that need to happen in order to cause those tiny little muscle contractions that we call shivering are going to begin here. This is going to be part of that regulatory process. All right, so just to kind of fire these off, the dorsal medial nucleus, and the dorsal medial, medial nucleus, uh, really what we're looking at here, dorsal, okay, so it's um, dorsum, and it's medial, so it's towards the midline. And right now, the dorsal hypothalamic area or the dorsal medial nucleus, not a lot of function there. Maybe some functions that have been discovered, but um, again, unique enough from a chemical composition perspective uh, that. Um, I'm sorry, the dorsal medial nucleus, rather, is, uh, is, is GI tract. Um, dorsal medial nucleus, I, I apologize. So some, some of the GI tract functions. So again, chemicals related to, to GI. Uh, paraventricular nucleus. This is well known to be involved in both water balance, so maintaining blood composition uh, in perspective to water, but also the stress response. The mammillary bodies or the mammillary body, uh, this actually aids in, uh, in some of the feeding uh, processes uh, and also sort of, uh, um, desires for food, uh, satiation and things like that. When am I hungry? It signal is being initiated here in the mammary body. So I mean, I guess mine's always active. Okay, so then the uh, uh, ventromedial nucleus and the ventral medial nucleus, again, another feeding response here. Satiety is also uh, linked in here with ventral medial body. So, so some, res some redundancy is starting to sort of arise out of these nuclei. The anterior nucleus and uh, also sometimes referred to as your anterior hypothalamic area, and you'll notice here that uh, we're going to have uh, some function in body temperature regulation from here. The preoptic nucleus. And the preoptic nucleus, uh, you can see that we have all of our optic stuff uh, occurring in here. Um, and so just before all of that optic stuff, we have both the superoptic nucleus and then the preoptic area. Um, somewhat both related to blood pressure, medial preoptic area is, is dealing with blood pressure from a chemical perspective. Uh, superoptic nucleus, we're going to get to that here in just a second, is dealing with some of the water balance, more of the blood chemistry uh, from a, a water perspective. The arcuate or the arcuate nucleus. The arcuate nucleus. 
Um, this is a portion, so in addition to the nuclei, we, we sometimes collapse nuclei together uh, or even take smaller regions of the nuclei. And the arcuate is actually part of what's known as the neostriatum. And the neostriatum has the arcuate and the nucleus accumbens, and they actually look like they may be involved in motivation. It's sort of a reward center in the brain. Okay, again, the super optic nucleus. Involved here with things like water balance, uh, regulating uh, blood water content. And then lastly, <coughs> the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And when we look at the suprachiasmatic nucleus, this is maybe one of the most interesting parts of the hypothalamus. You can see that it's a very small little region but it actually is what helps us to respond to changes in season and light and dark and basically the biological cues that help us maintain our circadian rhythm. So you can imagine if you fly over to China and you've got that 12 hour flight, typically it's an overnight flight, you leave at like 9 o'clock at night and you show up and it's 9 o'clock in the morning and you probably didn't sleep very well and we call that jet lag. And that jet lag is actually caused by a skew or skewing of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The expectation is no longer being met. Light is supposed to be dark. Dark is supposed to be light, and you switch it. And so you feel the effects of that as you reorganize your biological clocks. And then when you come back, you got to do it all over again. Okay, so there's a lot of really interesting things that are occurring here in the hypothalamus. A lot of these things that are occurring are endocrine functions, but a lot of them actually are not endocrine functions. They actually are more of a nervous system type role. So each nuclei has at least one known or suspected function. Again, some of these functions are certainly endocrine in nature. And when we say endocrine in nature, we are referring to the fact that we are releasing some chemical into the bloodstream and it's going to a distant target tissue. But many of these are actually neurological. And so this is neurotransmitter release across a synapse. So some are also going to be neurological. And in all reality, as is with most of our organ systems, we still don't understand everything that there is to know. And so there are other functions that probably will begin to be discovered and delineated. And so yet there are still other, other, uh, other unknown effects, things still being Okay, and we'll come back and we'll, we'll we'll sort of talk about the endocrine functions that we have here, and we'll begin to look at really what the hypothalamus is doing from an endocrine perspective. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce you to the second endocrine tissue organ that is being involved in the regulatory process, and that's going to be the pituitary. Now, the pituitary gland, it is a separate gland from the hypothalamus, but it is physically attached, at least through the infundibulum or the stalk, to the posterior lobe of the uh, of the, of the uh, uh, pituitary gland. Uh, so the hypothalamus actually can neurologically interact with the posterior lobe. It can interact through the bloodstream with the anterior lobe. Now what you're looking at here in this picture is all of the anatomical 
structures in, in the individual parts that are named in the pituitary gland. Now, the pituitary gland is actually more of the popular name. Uh, in the world of endocrinology, we actually refer to it as the hypothesis. Okay, so the hypothesis is the pituitary gland in proper endocrine terms. Now, this stock, it really is a stock, and it is actually going to suspend the pituitary from the base of the hypothalamus. And so the posterior lobe is going to be more of a nervous system type tissue, hence the name the neurohypothesis. And the anterior lobe is going to be more of a uh, epithelial type tissue, and so we call it the adenohypothesis. So this stalk that suspends the pituitary gland from the base of the hypothalamus, structurally this is known as the infundibulum. And we actually are going to find the infundibulum extending down into the sphenoid bone. Okay, so thinking back last semester, you have that very weird shaped bone at the base of the skull that looked like, uh, sort of like a bat, so it had the greater wings and the lesser wings, and then right in the middle we had Scylla Tercica. And if you remember Scylla Tercica, it actually means the Turkish saddle. And it's the Turkish saddle that actually houses the pituitary gland itself. This is going to be its physical location. So we are housed in the sphenoid bone, specifically in a bone mark known as Scylla tersica, Turkish sac. Okay, so to break this up even further, and what you can see in the image that uh, I'm illustrating here on the board, is that we have those two main parts or components of the pituitary gland. So two anatomical structures. And they are different in their origins, their embryonic origins, and also the composition and makeup of the tissues. Okay, so starting what we would properly call the anterior lobe or the anterior pituitary properly is called the adenohypothesis. The adenohypothesis. The anterior pituitary that I will abbreviate there as the answer pit. Uh, further categorization of the adenohypothesis, we're going to find two main what are known as parts. And parts is not just the word that I'm using here. Literally, we call them parts. And that's why you see the names pars tuberalis and pars distalis. P-A-R-S, pars literally means part. So the parts of the anterior pituitary are going to consist of the anterior lobe, which is what we call the pars distalis. And literally would mean the, dis, the more distal part. So this is the part that is furthest away from that connection with the hypothalamus. Now, what you can see here is there is this sort of tube-like structure that is uh, really at the, uh, the, the intersection point between the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary posterior pituitary. And it has a tube-like structure, so it's the tubular part, or pars tuberalis. Now this pars tuberalis, the, the anterior lobe is the pars distalis. The pars tuberalis is what we find associated with or around the infundibulum 
which I'm going to abbreviate there. Okay, so the infundibula. As soon as everybody has this, I'm going to have to make some adjustments. We good? Okay. Now, there is actually, there's only two labels here, pars tuberalis and pars distalis, but there's actually a third part of the posterior pituitary that forms during embryogenesis, but then digresses as we progress towards adulthood. And that's called the pars intermedia. And this pars intermedia is going to be very specific of the embryonic embryo. Um, that's not right. It's not right either. <laughs> it's going to be embryonic in nature. So we're after embryo stages, we're going to digress the pars intermedia to be left over with pars tuberalis and pars distalis. Now, the thing that's really interesting here, right? So hypothalamus is interacting with the pituitary gland and they communicate. But we have no direct connection here between the anterior lobe and the hypothalamus. So really what we're using here is rather than a neurological circuit, and I've just for your reference, I've now rotated 180 degrees. We're looking at the structure from the opposite side. So anterior pituitary is here on the right-hand side. The neuro cells or the neurological cells of the hypothalamus that help to regulate the function of the pituitary are doing so on a neuroendocrine basis. So we actually have a blood supply, and this is a really, really neat, unique blood supply. It's known as the anterior circuit. Uh, and this anterior circuit is going to be the way in which the anterior pituitary interfaces with the hypothalamus. Okay, so this will be the way that we interface with the hypothalamus. Uh, so why do we have to do it this way? Well, because we don't have, remember, what kind of tissue is this? This is from the same type of tissue that now coats the oral cavity. So it's epithelial in nature. And so it is not neurological in nature. And so we have no direct neural circuitry. There is no neurons that innervate the anterior pituitary from the hypothalamus. Rather, we interact through the blood supply, through blood vessels. Now, there are two places in human physiology where we see this type of uh, circulatory circuit. What you are looking at is a very, very unique circuit because we have two capillary beds that are spaced out by venules. That's abnormal because normally it's a blood vessel called an artery, interfaces with the capillaries, then interfaces with the, the vessel uh, known as a vein that brings blood back to the heart. So here we're actually going artery to a capillary to a vein to a capillary to a vein. The other place that we see this is in the, uh, in the liver, and this is known as a portal system. And so in this case, this particular portal system is the hypophyseal portal system. The other portal system in the liver is the hepatic portal system. What's the name of this circuit? The anterior circuit? Yeah, it's just generally known as the anterior circuit, and then specifically it's going to be the hypophyseal portal system. So it forms the hypophyseal portal system. Now, again, this term portal system, which the only other place we find a portal system is in the liver, it is this idea that we have one capillary bed, then a venule or a type of vein, a small vein, if you will, and a second capillary bed. And so we're actually going to refer to 
the capillary beds as a primary capillary bed and a secondary capillary bed within this portal system. So my primary capillaries are going to be the capillaries that are associated with or that are interacting with the hypothalamic neurons. Is that a venule with a vein, right? It's a type of vein, yes. A vein to a venule. It's basically a smaller version of a vein, and we're going to find out that there's a variety of different ways that we can classify those vessels on size in a few weeks when we talk about circulation. Okay, so that primary capillary bed is the capillary bed here that's interacting with these neurons from the hypothalamus. And then again, we have that intervening circulation made up of venules. And then we move the blood from there. Here you can see the, the venules, referred to as blood vessels on this figure, into a secondary capillary that is going to be associated with the cells of the pituitary gland. So associated with our pituitary cells. So I think intervening. Intervening? Intervening. Intervening. So it's just in between the two capillary beds. Primary capillary bed, intervening venules, secondary capillary bed. Primary is associated with the neural cells in the hypothalamus. And the secondary capillary bed is associated with the pituitary uh, cells of the anterior pituitary. So if I produce a molecule in the neurons of the hypothalamus, I can release those neurons into the bloodstream and they circulate to the pituitary gland and fully interact with the anterior pituitary to cause cellular changes to those pituitary cells. What we're going to find out is that we actually have a large number of different types of pituitary, anterior pituitary cells that all specifically produce just a single hormone. And so we can get this. Okay, so You can see a listing of all of these hormones that are going to be produced, generated by the anterior pituitary. We're going to come back and we're going to talk hopefully about these in a little bit more detail. But before we do that, let's deal with the posterior pituitary. Okay, so it's neurological in nature. It's a very similar tissue makeup to the hypothalamus and in fact has direct connection to hypothalamic neurons. We don't need an intervening portal system or, or, or blood supply. We're going to call this the neural hypothesis. And the neural hypothesis, again, I've switched this around. You now can see bone here from cella tercica, the sphenoid bone, uh, holding or saddling the uh, uh, pituitary gland, extending down from the hypothalamus. The, the neural hypothesis, again, more commonly called the posterior pituitary. I'm going to abbreviate that for post pit. Uh, here we actually are going to have three different parts. And again, parts is the term that we use. It's going to be the parts or the pars of the neural hypothesis. The first one is called the median eminence. Now, eminence is actually the word that means, oh, high one, oh, your eminence. And it is median, so this is actually going to be sort of the middle portion of the highest part of the posterior pituitary. So this is what's actually extending down from the hypothalamus and will eventually lead into the infundibulum. This is at the base of the ventricle, of the base of the third ventricle, 
uh, leading away from the hypothalamus. The next part is the infundibulum. I'm not going to spell that all the way out again. This is the stalk. This is what the pituitary gland hangs off of. And then we have this big last final part that's called the pars nervosa. And we would refer to the pars nervosa as the, uh, the posterior lobe. Okay, so more appropriate to call it the pars nervosa, nervous system part of the pituitary gland. Uh, again, what separates this from the anterior pituitary is its tissue composition. It consists primarily of nervous tissue. Okay, so it consists primarily of nervous tissue. Now, even still, it is not just simply an extension of the hypothalamus. And so we still actually have an interaction or an interface that we can delineate between the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary. So what does that interface to the hypothalamus look like? Well, if you're keeping track here, we know that the anterior pituitary interacts through the anterior circuit, so this makes a lot of sense that this would interact through the posterior circuit. And I do have a look here at the posterior circuit, and it's quite a bit different than the anterior circuit. Notice that rather than the neurons stopping short before they interact with the anterior pituitary, we're actually extending the axons of those neurons down into the posterior pituitary. So literally, the neurosecretory cells or the neurons of the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary axon, or the, the soma is in the hypothalamus, the axon and the uh, synapse is going to be contained down in the posterior pituitary, in the pars nervosa. Yes. You said that the other is the hypothesis was epithelial tissue. It's epithelial tissue. And that's that's a, a major difference. Yep. Okay, so we actually have the synapses of these neurons interacting with the blood supply. So we're not releasing anything from the hypothalamus to circulate it to the tissue of the posterior of the uh, uh, pituitary like we are with the anterior pituitary, we're actually transmitting those molecules down and then the blood supply we find located in the posterior pituitary. Okay, So really this posterior circuit is going to consist of a neural circuit which we refer to as the hypothalamal hypophyseal tract. So this is just simply the fact that we start in the hypothalamus, we end up in the, hypo in the uh, hypophyseal region or the hypophysis, and it is a neurological tract. It is neurons running from point A to point B. Now, what happens here, and, and, and the, the big difference here between posterior pituitary and anterior pituitary, the hormones that are produced and released by the anterior pituitary, they are actually being produced by the cells of the anterior pituitary themselves, and then they are released on demand. Here with the posterior pituitary, what's actually happening is these hormones, and there's really only two that are being produced, are being produced in the hypothalamus, in the soma of those neurons, and then they are transported through axonal transport down to the synapse to be released into the bloodstream within the posterior pituitary. So hormones of the posterior, uh, originating from the posterior pituitary are being made in the hypothalamus and only being released by the posterior pituitary, whereas the hormones of the anterior pituitary are being made and released 
by the cells of the anterior pituitary. Okay? So the hormones, again, are made in the hypothalamic soma. And through axonal transport, they end up in the nerve axon in the pituitary. Now, once they get collected in the in the in the pituitary gland, again, produced in the hypothalamus, axonally transported into the synaptic ball or synaptic knob in the posterior pituitary, they need to be signaled to be released. So they get collected up, and this should be something that looks relatively familiar. We saw the same thing with acetylcholine in the muscle, skeletal muscle cell. So we have vesicles of these neural hormones, oxytocin and arginine vasopressin, that are going to await for that signal for their release. And so at the bottom of the figure here, you can see that the hormones, oxytocin, um, this one is labeled as ADH, that's antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, also known as arginine vasopressin. Those are all synonyms, same name for the same hormone. So the blood supply that's involved here is what directly interacts with this particular neural circuit. This is where these two hormones, oxytocin and ADH or vas uh, vasopressin, are going to be picked up, transmitted through the bloodstream to their target tissues. Okay, so hopefully we got a good handle on how the hormones are being produced, where they're being produced, and then now a little bit about how they're being uh, transferred into the bloodstream. So let's deal with some of these hypothalamic hormones, and then we'll deal with some of the pituitary hormones. Okay, so starting with the hypothalamus hormones. You've already seen both of these figures. I'm just putting them up on the screen at the same time now, uh, so we can sort of look across all that is going on here. Now, the hypothalamic hormones, these by the way, are going to be my anterior pituitary hormones. These are going to be my posterior pituitary hormones. The hypothalamic hormones are actually going to be slightly different. So these are not hypothalamic hormones is what I'm trying to say. The hypothalamic hormones are actually going to be defined by their target. Okay, so we have source and we have target when we're talking about endocrine glands and endocrine hormones. Now, the hypothalamic hormones, we are actually going to have six that target to the anterior pituitary, and they're targeting through that hypophyseal uh, 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 portal system. Okay, so that's the definition of uh, the, the defined by target. The hormones from the hypothalamus that target the anterior, anterior pituitary, we're going to actually call those effectors. And there are six of them. So the anterior pituitary is going to be affected by six hypothalamically derived effectors or hormones. Now, in the world of endocrine hypotha uh, hypothalamic endocrinology, these are known most frequently as primarily releasing factors. There are five releasing factors and one inhibiting factor. So the hypothalamic effectors or the anterior pituitary effectors are going to have a releasing effect or an inhibiting effect. 
Releasing effect, effect is obviously going to cause pituitary hormones to be released or certain pituitary hormones to be released. The inhibiting factor is actually going to prevent hormone from uh, being released. Okay? Has everybody got this? Yes, good, go. Okay. All right, so of these six, what are they? And what exactly are they going to have happen? Our first is a releasing factor or a releasing hormone. And it's called thyrotropin releasing hormone. Again, what do I do as an endocrinologist? I abbreviate everything. So I never talk about thyrotropin releasing hormone. I always talk about TRH. Well, what TRH is going to do is it is actually going to cause thyrotrophs. And let me put that word up there. I'm just going to put the root. When you see this term here, trophs, that refers to the cell that is producing a certain type of hormone. So we are going to cause the thyrotrophs to release thyrotropins through the action of thyrotropin releasing hormone. Now the main uh, hormone that's going to be produced by the TR by TRH, thyrotroid, thyrotropin releasing hormone, is going to be this hormone. This is the anterior pituitary hormone called TSH. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. And it's going to actually target to the thyroid. Okay? And we're going to come back on all of this, and I'm actually going to kind of um, map one of these circuits out or one of these axes out so that you can see it. But I'm going to lay all of this stuff up here. So you've got a lot of different words that sound really, really similar. You have tropins and you have tropes. Tropins are the hormones. Tropes are the cells that are producing those hormones. Next is going to be corticotropin releasing hormone. CRH. And CRH is actually going to cause a hormone ACTH, adenocorticotropic, uh, corticotropic hormone to be released from the anterior pituitary to car, uh, uh, target to the cortex of the adrenal gland, the outer surface of the adrenal gland capped on top of the kidney. The next hor uh, hypothalamic hormone here is the gonadotropin releasing hormone. And gonadotropin releasing hormone going to call that GnRH. This is actually going to target two anterior pituitary hormones. They are going to be FSH and LH. FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. LH is luteinizing hormone. And these help with progressions in males of spermatogenesis, the production of sperm, and maturation of sperm, and in the female with production and release of the ovum. It takes the ovum through its complete uh, cycle of uh, development and maturation. Uh, so it's going to target the testicular tissue and the ovarian tissue. The gonadotropin releasing hormone interacts with gonadotrophs to produce the gonadotrophs of FSH and LH, which are released into the bloodstream to interact with testes and ovaries. The next hormone is the growth hormone releasing hormone. I like to rhyme hormone with hormone. I think that's pretty, pretty good English there. GHRH. And so we have a hormone called growth hormone. And growth hormone, or GH, which goes to a variety of different tissues in the body, is going to be stimulated by growth hormone releasing hormone. And it's going to interact with cells that actually produce the growth hormone in the pituitary gland. All right, so there are two more hormones. These are the main hormones that are known as releasing factors. The next hormone, 
very interestingly, is actually an inhibiting factor. Now, this is going to work slightly different than the releasing factors. So this is going to be prolactin inhibiting factor or prolactin inhibiting hormone, most frequently abbreviated as PIH. Now, prolactin inhibiting hormone or factor, whatever you call it, it is going to interact with the lactotrophs, the cells that produce prolactin. And since it is an inhibiting factor, as long as this signal is high, those lactotrophs are going to be inhibited from producing the hormone. In other words, all of the other cells in the pituitary that we've already mentioned, they have to be stimulated by a, horm a, a hypothalamic hormone to release their substance. Here, when prolactin is uh, prolactin inhibiting factor is present, the pro uh, lactotrophs do not produce pro uh, their prolactin. If we remove the inhibiting factor, prolactin activity increases. So we're actually preventing release rather than in, uh, uh, in creating release. Okay? You're going to recognize prolactin inhibiting factor by another name. It's actually also dopamine. So dopamine is released by the hypothalamus, interacts with the lactotrophs to prevent their function of producing prolactin. Dopamine levels drop or pro, uh, prolactin inhibiting factor levels drop and prolactin production increases. This is going to target to uh, mammary glands uh, in the, um, at least in the mammals, and this is what causes uh, a thing called milk letdown uh, during nurturing and feeding of an infant. So you probably want to have high levels of dopamine unless you're feeding a child. And so we're actually going to see low levels of prolactin normally found, and then dopamine release or prolactin inhibiting factor release is going to be lifted when let down or milk production is required. Now, the last hypothalamic hormone that's produced is called somatostatin. This is actually also another inhibiting factor. Um, and, and the thing that's really interesting about this is the first five that we've talked about, the first five hormones, are primarily being produced by the hypothalamus. In fact, to an extent where it's almost exclusive. There actually are some other places where we see things like dopamine and a few of the other hormones being produced at very low levels. But the primary production point is going to be the hypothalamus. Somatostatin is slightly different. We actually find somatostatin in a variety of other tissues as well, including the pancreas. But what somatostatin does is it actually acts as an inhibiting factor for growth hormone. And so we actually are regulating, we have sort of this dance with growth hormone production. Uh, when uh, releasing hormone levels are high, growth hormone levels increase. But they can be inhibited by the release of somatostatin. So somatostatin actually is occasionally referred to as growth hormone inhibiting hormone or inhibiting factor. But because we actually find it in other tissues, in particular the pancreas, was originally called somatostatin within the pancreas, and since it's actually the same molecule, we now attribute the same name to that particular hormone. So each of these six different releasing and or inhibiting factors, again, they have to be released into that primary capillary bed. So we have neural secretion of these factors onto that primary capillary bed. They get picked up in the primary capillary bed and get transported through the hypophyseal portal system to interact with the anterior pituitary. So going to be released into the bloodstream, and again, this is occurring through that very unique hypophyseal portal system. Now, you'll notice uh, in the other figure here dealing with the posterior pituitary, and I've already gone over this just a little bit of detail, we have just two hormones that are being produced. And they are a shared hormone between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland.
So the post pit in the pituitary, the two hormone hormones are being stored. This is the storage site or the storage depot for these two hormones. They are being produced biochemically in the hypothalamus. So they are being produced biochemically in the hypothalamus and are just simply stored in the posterior pituitary and also are going to be released from the posterior pituitary. Remember, we don't really have a blood supply here interacting with those neurons in the hypothalamus. And the synapse is actually in the posterior pituitary. So that's where that capillary bed is going to be found. Yeah, Mary. Right Produced. The two hormones, are we uh, have mentioned them. One of them is going to be oxytocin. And oxytocin, we actually, within the context of hypothalamic nuclei, we're going to find this in the PVN, the paraventricular nucleus. Okay, so if we go back to the figure with all the uh, nuclei within the cell, we could find the paraventricular nucleus, and this is going to have the uh, neurons extending from the PVN, the paraventricular nucleus, extending into the posterior pituitary, and we would find oxytocin being produced there. When you come back next week on Monday, you don't have Monday off, when you get here on Monday next week, we will begin to deal with antidiuretic hormone, the other posterior pituitary hormone.